Hello and welcome to lecture number one. Today's topic will be the origins of the United States Constitution. There are three main themes to be addressed in this presentation. Initially, we'll discuss the first Constitution of the United States and some of its problems. Next, we'll explore some of the background of the Constitutional Convention, um, dealing with some of the problems that they were facing as well as some of the important people who were there. Finally, the big takeaway is that there were many controversies, yet they were resolved through compromise at the Constitutional Convention. That will kind of be the core of today's topic. So I'd like to begin by talking about the first Constitution of the United States and some of its problems. This map identifies the land included in the original 13 states and territories at the end of the American Revolution. Notice the area in pink on the right, the eastern seaboard. Well, those included the first 13 colonies that eventually became states. U.S. territory actually expanded all the way to the Mississippi River, as you see with the arrows and the second circle. In order to provide enough unity for those 13 colonies that were fighting to become states, they got together and they developed the first Constitution of the United States. The name of that Constitution was the Articles of Confederation. We'll explore some of the problems associated with the Articles next. While the Articles provided enough unity for the colonies to defeat the mighty British Empire, there were some problems associated with it. First of all, each state when it came to passing legislation, had one vote, regardless of its size or its population. Let me show you on the next slide. Each individual state had a lot of power under the Articles. One state had one vote. So this meant that a large state like Virginia, with a population of about 750,000 people, had as much political power and clout, so to speak, as a state like Delaware, with only 60,000 people. Was this going to be a nation based upon the power of the people or the power of individual states? There were some apparent additional problems with the Articles. Secondly, um, there was neither an executive nor a judicial branch. Essentially, there was only one branch of government, the legislative branch, and there was a national Congress. Finally, states had a tremendous amount of power, as mentioned earlier. Some of the powers that they had was to coin their own money and even conduct their own foreign policy. States were allowed to levy taxes, but the national government did not. Well, let me try to explain in the next slide uh, some issues with taxation. I don't know anyone who likes to pay taxes, but our tax dollars go toward a range of things. On the left, we see an image of George Washington at Valley Forge. During the Revolutionary War, one of the problems he continually faced was a lack of funding for things like uniforms, boots, things like that for his soldiers. On the right, we see some currency from the state of South Carolina. If you go to Europe, you use the Euro. If you go to Mexico, they use pesos. In the United States, there were multiple currencies. There was South Carolina, New York, Pennsylvania. Each state had its own currency. It created chaos for business owners. Taken collectively, these range of problems with the Articles prompted some to want to try to modify those Articles or maybe even start from scratch. The fancy name for the meeting in order to get together to try to modify the Articles of Confederation is called the Constitutional Convention. Delegates met in 1787. I'll talk about that next. Do you know where they met? For the Constitutional Convention, it was in the nation's largest city, Philadelphia. The name of the building was Independence Hall. It's shown here in the image. One of the things I'll point out would be the division among the delegates to the Constitutional Convention, but there was one philosophy or one idea that united all of them. They wanted to establish a republic. Here's a one-sentence textbook definition of a republic. It's when eligible citizens elect people or representatives who make decisions and establish policies for them. In the United States, we live in a type of a democracy. The type of democracy 
is a republic. There were 55 delegates from several states who attended meetings in Philadelphia. We're not going to talk about all of them, but I would like to highlight some of the important individuals who shaped the discussions at the Constitutional Convention. This painting represents some of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention. Some people have argued that the so-called greatest minds in American history were among the 55 delegates to the Constitutional Convention. Probably the most famous American among the American people is shown here. George Washington. He was the head of the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War that defeated the mighty British Empire. One of the first decisions made by the delegates to the convention was to have Washington preside over their meetings each day as chair. The oldest delegate to the Constitutional Convention was over 80 years old. It was Ben Franklin. During the war, he had served as a diplomat and successfully was able to get the French to fight on behalf of the colonies. On the right, we see someone else. He was only 36 years old and is somewhat underrated as a political figure. His name was James Madison, a Virginia politician. If there were only 55 delegates, all of whom were white men at the Constitutional Convention, there were plenty of people who were not there. However, I did want to point out one. He's shown here. Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson wasn't even in the country during the Constitutional Convention. The individual who was recognized as the so-called father or author of the Constitution was James Madison. We'll explore some of the reasons why he's considered to have such an important role next. Next, we'll explore some of the controversies and how they were resolved through compromise at the Constitutional Convention. The first dealt with how each state would be represented in Congress. Madison's Virginia plan set the stage for one of the first controversies. Interestingly, though, uh, the first two provisions of it were actually accepted by everyone. First of all, he called for the elimination of the Articles of Confederation. He said there were so many problems with the Articles, they had to start from scratch, and that was accepted. Secondly, he argued that the national government should be divided into three branches, the legislative, executive, and judicial. Here we see kind of a visual representation of this separation of powers. Madison argued that the legislative branch should be the most powerful of the three branches. While those first two proposals met with approval by the delegates to the convention, Madison's third main idea was very controversial. He argued that representation in the legislative branch should be determined entirely by each state's population. Here we can go back to that visual representation. Um, Madison's idea here, if to put it another way, is the number of representatives for each state would be determined entirely by each state's population. As you might suspect, the big states thought this was a good idea, but individuals from small states disagreed wholeheartedly. They would lose a lot of power under this new system. The success of the convention was threatened by the issue of how each state would be represented, bigger, small. Finally, cooler heads prevailed uh, when the oldest delegate, Benjamin Franklin, developed a compromise, or at least support for what came to be known as the Great Compromise. It actually accepted much of Madison's Virginia plan, but it had a key distinction. It separated the legislative branch into two different chambers. The upper chamber would be the Senate, and every state would be treated equally. There would be two senators for each state. In the House of Representatives, the number would be determined by each state's population. This struck a balance between the big and the small states. The big states liked the makeup of the House of Representatives. The small states liked the Senate. Again, here we see that visual representation uh, of separation of powers and the Great Compromise. The legislative branch was divided into the House and Senate. The number of representatives for each state was based entirely on a state's population. 
and this made people from the large states happy. I'd like to jump ahead just a little bit and look at some current events. Every 10 years, we have a census, and based upon the 2020 census, Michigan has 13 members of the United States House of Representatives. On the right, you see a map that identifies the, different, the 13 different districts. Each district these days represents about 750,000 people. Michigan is one of the larger states, uh, but um, it's kind of in the top tier, but not the largest uh, among others. Uh, so anyway, this is the map that identifies the current congressional districts for the state of Michigan. Again, each state is treated equally in the United States Senate. Each state, whether it's in the North, the South, large or small, has two senators. The topic of slavery also divided delegates to the Constitutional Convention. The controversy dealing with slavery wasn't whether or not slavery should be protected in the Constitution, unfortunately. Instead, it was, well, how would they count slaves when determining each state's population? Here we are back at the original 13 states and territories. That red line indicates an area where south of that, slaves made up a large portion of the population because they played a crucial role in the south's economy. Slaves made up a large percentage of the population of many southern states. Representatives from those states would not even consider the elimination of slavery. But what they wanted to know was, well, how should we count slaves when determining each state's population? How to count slaves was important because it determined the number of members of the House of Representatives for each state. That's why this was so controversial. Rather than be, this being a disagreement between the big and the small states, Instead, this issue of slavery divided northern and southern states. Once again, the future of the country and the future of the convention was threatened. The issue of slavery, too, was resolved by compromise. 55 of the so-called greatest minds in American history decided that when determining a state's population, one slave was equal to three-fifths of a person. Yeah, so-called greatest minds in American history. The issue of slavery would continue to divide the country until the Civil War of the 1860s. What was clear was that the delegates to the convention actually were embarrassed by their protection of slavery. The word slave does not appear in the Constitution. At one point, the word other persons, uh, def clearly referring to slaves, um, appears in the Constitution as well as the phrase servant. Unfortunately, the Constitution actually justified and protected slavery. The last controversy I'd like to address dealt with electing the President of the United States, and it resulted in the creation of the Electoral College. There were lots of questions dealing with the chief executive. What should they call this person? How long should the length of term be? How many should there be? Should there be two presidents? Should there be three? Should there just be one? There were lots and lots of questions. Eventually, they decided to choose only one president, and that individual would be elected for one four-year term. But still, there were lots of questions about how to choose this individual. Some argued that the American people or voters should directly elect this president. Others said, no, it should be members of the House or the Senate. Eventually, they chose something unique. They decided to create something called the Electoral College. I'd like to talk next about how the Electoral College works. There are two key concepts I'd like to address when it comes to explaining how the Electoral College works. First, in order to win a presidential election, a candidate must win a majority of electoral votes. The magic number, so to speak, these days is 270. Well, how do we get this number of 270? Well, I'll try to show. First of all, 
we start with the number 435. That's the number of members of the House of Representatives. Then you add 100 because that's the total number of members of the Senate. Then you add three because Washington DC is not a state, but it's treated like a state when it comes to a presidential election. The total number of electoral votes available is 538. A majority or over half of 538 is 270. So that's where we get the number of 270 electoral votes that a candidate needs in order to win the presidency. You might say, okay, I can memorize that. That's fine and dandy. But how does a person win electoral votes? Well, that's the second key concept. The candidate who wins the most popular votes in an individual state wins all of that state's pledged electoral votes. Let's think of it this way. Rather than having one election on a Tuesday in November every four years for president, essentially what we have are 51 elections, one in every state plus Washington, D.C., because that's how those electoral votes are handed out. They're handed out on a state by state basis. Let's use Michigan as an example to explain this process. So first of all, Michigan has 13 members of the House of Representatives. And Michigan also has two U.S. Senators. 13 plus 2 equals 15. So Michigan has 15 electoral votes. All right, so please make sure that you do not try to memorize this. I'm not trying to to focus on that, but I would like to provide an example of the distribution of electoral votes. If you look here, um, we see the number of electoral votes for each state. Um, Alaska is a very small state, so Alaska doesn't have as many people. Alaska only has three electoral votes. The largest state in the union is California with 54 electoral votes. It's actually been the largest state in the union in terms of population for many years. Uh, look down here at Florida. Florida went from 29 electoral votes on the previous census to 30. There are more people moving to Florida and their population is growing faster than other states. And then on the right, we see Michigan. Michigan in the past had as many as 21 electoral votes. Well, in the last census, uh, we went from 16 to 15 electoral votes. Here we see some additional examples. Uh, New York used to be the largest state in the union for decades. Well, it lost a member of the House of Representatives, so it went from 29 to 28 electoral votes. Another state in the Great Lakes was Ohio, and Ohio lost an electoral vote. Which state was the big winner? Well, Texas went from 38 electoral votes to 40. Uh, just a side note, in the last two census cycles, Texas has gained six electoral votes because its population is growing so quickly. So what happened in Michigan in 2020? Well, based upon the popular vote, Joe Biden won the state with 50.6% of the popular vote. It was a pretty close election. So as a result of the way the Electoral College works, Joe Biden received all of Michigan's pledged electoral votes. The data here shows the national results from the 2020 election. Joe Biden eventually won 306 electoral votes to President Trump's 232. Voter turnout in 2020 was very high at about 66.7% of eligible voters actually voting in the 2020 election. Here we see that electoral map again. The blue states on this map identify states won by Joe Biden. Notice that he had strong support in the far west, the Great Lakes, as well as the northeast. Donald Trump had strong support in the American South, the Great Plains, and the Intermountain West. Here we see another recent presidential election result set of data. In 2016, President Trump clearly won the presidency. 
with 306 electoral votes to Hillary Clinton's 232. However, the popular vote was different. Clinton actually received 3 million more popular votes by average Americans um, uh, than President Trump did. Uh, this is rare, but it has happened uh, at other times in American history. When exploring other presidential elections, this has happened sometimes in the past. So for example, in the year 2000, Al Gore received about a half a million more popular votes by the American people than George W. Bush, yet George W. Bush clearly won over half of the electoral vote. This also happened in 1888. Uh, at that time, there were fewer states, so a majority of electoral votes was 206. Benjamin Harrison clearly won a majority with 233, yet Grover Cleveland won the popular vote. If a candidate is, has a problem with the results in a particular state or in an election, what you do is you file a lawsuit. You go through the judicial system. And so that's what candidate Trump did in many cases. In 2020, over, there were over 60 court cases undertaken by President Trump's campaign in several states where they challenged the results of those elections. In every single case, President Trump lost. In fact, many of those cases were heard by judges that were appointed by President Trump himself. Eventually, every state certified its election results, which confirmed that Joe Biden won the election in 2020. Once officials in each state have certified the results in that state, they send them off to Congress, and then Congress meets in early January to count the electoral votes submitted from each state. In general, this is a simple formality. However, in January of 2021, they had some problems. Just as members of Congress were in the act of actually certifying the election and following a speech by President Trump, a group of Trump supporters stormed the United States Capitol, overran the police, and occupied the Capitol. This brought uh, the count to a halt for a time, but that was only temporary. Uh, eventually that evening, uh, they finished counting the vote. It was actually the next morning. Um, the uh, officials, Democrats as well as Republicans, described these events as an insurrection, a violent assault by a mob, and a major rebellion. This was the first time the United States Capitol had been overrun in such a way since the War of 1812 when the British did it. Why did so many people storm the U.S. Capitol and trespass? Well, they kept hearing claims of election fraud in the 2020 election, which were actually false. The national security team that was appointed by President Trump declared that the election was the most secure in American history. They continued by saying that there was no evidence that in any way the election was compromised. You can also see a comment from President Trump's attorney general who had some choice words to say about the false claims of election fraud. Fox News actually faced a lawsuit as a result of some of the lies that they had spread dealing with their coverage of the Dominion voting systems in the election. Eventually, they agreed to pay almost $800 million to the Dominion voting systems because they had spread lies and false election claims about that company. There were numerous claims of election fraud in the 2020 election in many states, uh, but one actually took place close by here in Mason County, uh, and it dealt with a situation in Hamlin Township, which is actually where I vote. So the voter rolls or the names of the people who vote are actually public information. One person's birth date was misidentified. Uh, a person was identified as being 119 years old. This was a mistake. The Hamlin Township clerk actually fixed this before the election. However, some people were looking at the voter rolls after the election and they noticed this. Um, even though it had been fixed officially, it wasn't public yet. And the Hamlin Township clerk received all sorts of threats 
uh, in the middle of the night, phone calls, emails, threats to her life, a lot of harassment. And so this is an example of some of these false election claims in the 2020 election. There's one last thing I'd like to say for now about the 2020 election, uh, and that deals with confidence in elections. Many Americans have lost confidence in the election system. Um, this is a problem, and it's really saddening uh, for me. So I've got a suggestion. Become a poll worker and see for yourself. I did. I actually worked as a poll worker, and this gave me a greater understanding of the system and deepened my confidence in the quality and the security of our election. So I'd like you to do the same, especially if you um, have some have lost confidence in the system. Uh, but I guess we better move on and go on to uh, some additional things associated with this lecture. Now, earlier in the lecture, I said, in order to win a presidential election, a candidate must win a majority of electoral votes. Well, what if there are a whole bunch of people who run for president and no one wins a majority? Well, the Constitution has a solution. The United States House of Representatives would pick the next president among the top three finishers in electoral votes. The House of Representatives has had to take these steps. In 1824, there were four candidates running for the presidency. At that time, we had fewer states. So in order to win a majority of electoral votes, a candidate had to garner 131. Well, you can see that the most electoral votes won were by Andrew Jackson at 99, and 99 is less than 131. So the House of Representatives convened, and they had to pick the next president. Eventually, they chose John Quincy Adams. Now, you might be saying, well, what happened then? Well, uh, it caused quite a controversy. And if you'd like to learn more about that, maybe you can take my U.S. history class before, up to 1877. You can learn about a big controversy in American history there. Well, hopefully that explanation wasn't too confusing. I did have a couple of concluding remarks. To sum up some of the key ideas from this lecture, first of all, the Articles of Confederation was the name of the first constitution of the United States. You should also be able to identify some of the key individuals who shaped events at the Constitutional Convention. And finally, you should be able to explain three controversies from the convention itself and evaluate which you think was the most important. Well, that ends the first lecture for our class. I hope you learned something new, and we'll see you online. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.